ఎందరో మహానుభావులు అందరికీ వందనములు దిస్ ఇస్ స్టేట్ ఫ్రమ్ సెయింట్ త్యాగరాజ విచ్ ఎసెన్షియలీ మీన్స్ టు ఆల్ దీస్ గ్రేట్ సోల్స్ అసెంబ్లీ హియర్ మై ప్రణామ్స్ a number of people come up to me and say you are a surgeon you are a doctor you are in a noble profession but i keep thinking that there is no nobler or a better profession than than teaching so thank you very much for inviting me here to give this uh, talk it's a totally different thing from what you heard so far nothing to do with education or with uh, teaching teachers or teaching students or uh, teaching uh, educationists and administrators and so on this is like you know you, you go to some uh, it's like uh, you suddenly you are in a or you paid for uh, DDSJ, that is Dulani Adil Leja in a movie and then you find this Alfred Hitchcock movie being, being shown. So I'm going to take you on a, to a totally different uh, level altogether. That's the title of my talk. I had sent three uh, topics and this was the one that was uh, chosen by the administrators. So I'm, be prepared to get transformed. I know you'll have a bit of a problem with my uh, surname. Oops. that is will go but you may have some problem like i said in pronouncing that sunny i'll let you into a little secret on how to pronounce it properly let's say there are two of you and you want to go and uh, observe the one of the ipl matches two of you you have just one ticket so question is who will go you add an l to that it will become will go and that will be as close as you know to pronouncing my surname correctly as as anything else like what so what is transformative technologies now i'm one of those guys who likes to walk around, to walk around but i'm tied on by this uh, mic here so i'm going to stand here and uh, I, uh, uh, do i have one okay does that work yep it does hey thanks uh what are transformative technologies now these are new technologies like the previous speaker said that are coming almost on a minute to minute basis new technologies uh, coming up and we have to keep responding to these to keep accepting these some of them might even disrupt the kind of life that we are leading but we need to be aware of what these technologies are so that we are better prepared to face the world so as i said it can be disrupting and uh, disruption is something that can drastically alter or destroy the structure of society and these technologies have the capacity to change our lifestyle whether be it at, at home at work or even globally just bear with me for just one minute while i define these certain terms before i go along and try and make it more interesting but i need to define some of these terms so that we all know what we are talking about uh it might not make too much sense initially but uh, like i said bear with me they will so what is transformative technology it's a new emerging technology that has the capacity to suddenly displace or even destroy an existing technology and it can be a product or even a service which helps to create a new market and significantly weaken drastically change or destroy an existing market or service or a product or or a market category there are two types of technologies one is sustaining when i say sustaining there is a technology already existing which becomes better over a period of time it becomes better and faster and cheaper and more customizable and an example best example is your cell phone the first cell phones were huge almost like bricks with a huge antenna sticking out on top but with time they became better and faster and well cheaper for the kind of work that they do nowadays the smartphones and they become more customizable so that's a sustaining kind of a development of of a technology there can be a transformative technology which is a new technology initially lacks refinement it's rather crude it's relevant only to a few people it's very costly but again over a period of time it becomes better and faster and cheaper and more customizable now that is the new mantra better and faster and cheaper and customizable that's the new mantra that i'm going to be uh, telling you about uh in my talk today so what are these technologies and why should we learn about them it's like you know you want to take your family to to the beach and you hear that there could be a, a tsunami so what do you do you decide not to go that is one another de- decision could be no i don't think it's going to happen i'm going to go there so if you disregard what's going to happen be prepared to get blown away be prepared to get swept away that's the reason why we need to know about these new technologies 
Right, now let's come to the actual ones. I'm going to give you some examples. I'm going to show you a slide of New York, Fifth Avenue, New York. The year is 1900. Horse-drawn carriages. Where is the car? We don't have too much time. That is the car. Amongst a sea of horse-drawn carriages. I'm going to show you the same road, Fifth Avenue, New York, 1913. Coming up, New York, Fifth Avenue, 1913. Where is the horse? In 13 years, the whole horse-drawn carriage industry, the makers of carriages, the breeders of horses, the makers of reins, the makers of stirrups, the makers of saddles, the makers of what have you, totally destroyed. It's not going to come back again. In those days, if you had a horse, you were poor. If you had a car, you were very rich. Nowadays, if you have a car, you are sort of, okay, you need to be Vijay Malia to own a horse. You know, totally, totally disrupted the kind of society that we're leading in. Let's talk about other examples. So it, it can happen very, very quickly, very, very suddenly. The old laptop, I'm not talking about that lady now. You know, the naughty guys are thinking about that, and maybe some of you know people who have that kind of laptop. I'm talking about the typewriter. And what's happened to that laptop? Replaced by the PC. Gone, typewriter gone forever, never going to come back again, right? Let's talk about the way we listen to music. Remember the old one that you had to crank? And if you forgot to crank that, you had the needles and you had these uh, plates and so on, the vinyl plates. If you forgot to crank it up, you'll have, you know, in a dika dika day day dai and then you have to crank it, then ram pam pos, ram pam pos, right? So then came the, the tape recorder, and all of you remember, I think, how you had to really press hard on the play button to you know, do play, how you had to press hard on both the play and record button if you want to record, and then for the first time ever, you heard your own voice. And all of you who thought, you know, you had voices like Hemant Kumar, suddenly found that you have a voice like Sachin Tendulkar. And you say, oh, that's not my voice. That's, you know, something wrong with that instrument. No. For the first time, all you ladies who thought you, you had voices like Lata Mangeshkar, and it turned out to be you had a, a voice like Sharada. That's, then came the Walkman, the Discman, then came the iPod, and now every taxi driver has this. For a few hundred rupees, thousands of songs, old Hindi songs, new Hindi songs, English songs. So what do you want to listen to, he asks you when you're going in a, in a car, in a taxi. Let's talk about big companies. AT&T was the world's largest telecom company. In 1985, they had developed the world's first mobile phone. They wanted to find out what would be the kind of usage, what would be the kind of market 15 years down the line in 2000. So they hired McKinsey the world's best-known business management consultants, full of students from Harvard, from Stanford, and so on, and various other universities, and paid lots of money, I'm sure. They did a lot of research and said, came to this conclusion, less than one million, maybe about 900,000 people will be using a mobile phone in 15 years' time. What actually happened? The answer was 109 million. From 1985 to 2010, 2011, they did not have a mobile phone. Kodak. Yellow Giant, as it was called. Year 2000, record profits. $1.4 billion of net profits. The best time to be in the photographic field. That's what the CEO said. 2012, files for bankruptcy. In 12 years, from the best year ever to total bankruptcy. And what happened? The digital camera. And Kodak had invented a digital camera. What was the Kodak model? Every time you took a picture, Kodak made money because of the film. There were about 36 images that you could have, 36 photographs you could take per film. If you squeezed out the 37 or 38, you were damn happy that you screwed Kodak, you know? Yeah. Happiness, yeah, you know, get 37, 38 pictures in one row. Every time you wanted a printout, Kodak made money. You want copies, Kodak made money. You want an enlargement, Kodak made money. The digital camera changed all that. Now you just buy one CF card or an SD card or something, you take hundreds and thousands of photographs, you upload them onto what is this, uh, Instagram or Facebook, or you download into an external hard drive, and 
format the card, use it again and again and again. So just when you thought, okay, fine, the next big thing is going to be the external hard drive, think again, because scientists have come up with this technology of storing data in DNA, not just photographs, data. The amount of data that would require the size of a huge megastore, a Walmart megastore, can be fitted into DNA the size of a sugar cube. So, but at present, of course, this is a very, very costly technology. But as I said, over a period of time, these technologies become better and faster and cheaper and more customizable. Now, it's getting a little hot under the light, so I think I want to take off my coat, okay? That's all I'm going to take off. It's not a strip tease or something here. So bear with me. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. So, DNA, right? All of us know about this story. Google approaches Yahoo and says, can you buy us for half a million dollars? And Yahoo says, you're not, you're not, no, for one million dollars. And Yahoo says, you're not even worth half a million dollars. Now Google is worth 500 billion dollars. So what happens? Why do smart people, you know, these Harvard graduates and Stanford graduates, they're not, not idiots. So why do smart people in smart companies fail to see the approaching science or even to lead the disruption themselves? And it's usually the so-called experts and the insiders who go around saying, ah, no, it's not going to happen. Aeroplanes, interesting toys, will never work, never take part in warfare. Within 15 years, taking part in the First World War. Computers will never replace newsprint. You know, it goes on and on. All these are so-called experts and the insiders. So why do these people, smart people, fail to read the signs? That's because of three things. One is transformation models. They fail to see that. They fail to realize that these technologies are growing exponentially. And thirdly, business model innovation is as important. Look at Steve Jobs, for example. When Steve Jobs was in Apple the first time, he had a great product, couldn't market it. Almost sank. In his second avatar, he came back and of course then marketed Apple well. That's a whole uh, totally new different story altogether. So let's look at each one of these in, in turn. Transformation models. There can be transformation from below. And that's what I said about sustaining things. The, your, your cell phone, your computers and so on. All these are becoming better over a period of time and better and faster and cheaper and more customizable. So that is going up from below. Existing technology which becomes better over a period of time. There can be transformation from above. Meaning you have a technology which is very, very costly. The Roadster, which was released in 2008, cost $110,000, but only 2,500 cars were sold. Obviously, as costly as a Porsche Carrera 111, uh, 911, but you need to charge it every day. It only goes for about 100 miles or so. Not going to sell. So you think the people in Detroit or in uh, like Ford or Chrysler or uh, Dodge and all these guys, or in, in, in Germany, Volkswagen and all these guys, you think these CEOs were really disturbed by the, the appearance of this Tesla Roadster? Not at all. They probably were sitting in their uh, rooms uh, with one leg over the other, a cigar in one hand, cognac in the other, and that other kind of laptop on their laps maybe, saying, ha, Tesla, electric, look at, it's not going to happen. But then in 2012 came this, the Tesla Model S. Yeah, just look at that, you can, all, I can see all the men drooling over it already. $75,000. Performance of a Porsche Carrera 911, 0 to 100 in 3 seconds. It could cover 240 miles on a single charge. So this became, and already more than 200,000 cars sold. So now is Detroit listening, now they are trembling. Or it can be a big bang disruption, meaning no technology existed before, but suddenly a new technology comes in. And I'm talking about Garmin, I don't know how many of you have heard about Garmin GPS. This is a GPS device, it's almost the size of your mobile phone. You need to go outside, switch it on, wait for it to sort of lock into the, the satellites above, and then it will give you a reading as to where you are and then download a map of that area. Very useful for people who are you know, hitchhiking, hiking up in the mountains and uh, so on, so that they didn't get lost. But then came Google Maps. It's on your mobile phone now. Everyone is GPS ready. And it comes with an exciting, very sexy voice. Go 200 meters, turn left at the roundabout. 100 meters 
down the line with my house. Open the door. Door is open. You can come upstairs to my bedroom. Yeah, it hasn't got that far yet. Not yet. But it comes with a sexy voice now. No? Garmin went from $120 down to $40 in a year, the stocks. It's coming up slowly because they've had to sort of think out of the box and come up with new technologies. So how can these products, next question, how can they be better and faster and cheaper and more customizable? What, what makes them this? And that's because these technologies are growing in an exponential fashion. It's exploding. And why is that happening? Various things. One of them is the transistors. The number of transistors in the world grew by a billion times from 1971 to 2011. A billion times. It's growing at 41.4% compounded annual growth rate. It's growing almost at 100% every two years. And all internet jobs, all your software, all your hardware is growing according to this, which is called the Moore's Law. 41.4% year on year. The cost to transmit one bit of data is decreasing by 50% every nine months. The cost of storing one bit of data is going down by 50% every 18 months. Hendy is now. The cost per pixel is going down by 100% every 18 months. And that's the reason why even in your mobile phones, you have your 20 megapixel, 30 megapixel cameras in your mobile phone. So that is the reason why, because the pixel cost is going down by that much. And who was Hendy? Hendy was working for Kodak in 1983 in Australia. And they didn't even listen to it. So they had bright guys even in their own company. S number of sensors grew by 222% compounded annual growth rate. It is slowing down now. Some observers believe that it will grow at about 20%, some at about 56%. But even at that rate, by 2025 20, or so, you're going to have 10 trillion to 100 trillion sensors. Each person will have about 10 million sensors. So what do you do with these sensors? What does it mean? You can put these sensors anywhere. For example, you can put it in a refrigerator. So each time you take out a six pack of beer, each time you take out a crate of eggs, each time you take out, let's say, some 12 potatoes or cabbages or whatever, it will sense that. It will then contract your grocer, order a similar amount of eggs, or your, your uh, booze shop, order a similar amount of beer, so you have sensors everywhere and this is what is meant by an internet of things where everything is connected to everything else. And because of these exponential growth of technologies, we have 3D printing, we have robotics, we have artificial intelligence, we have electric cars, we have autonomous cars, uh, you have uh, storage solutions and so many other things, which we'll look at just one or two of them. You all heard of Fitbit, you know that band that people wear around their uh, wrists nowadays? When you go for a run or you go for a walk, it records the distance you've covered, uh, the area that you've covered, you can download it onto your computer. Well, this is called Bella Beat. It comes as a silver or a gold piece, which is more like a necklace, a necklace around your neck for the ladies. It records the fetal heartbeat. And that can be shared with your friends, with your other colleagues, with the other pregnant ladies, with your family. It can be shared with your obstetrician gynecologist. So if she detects far away that there is something wrong with your fetal heart rate, you can immediately rush to the hospital and she'll call you there and then whatever measures need to be taken can be taken. Again, because of sensors. It's available in India, it costs about 8,000 or 10,000 rupees, depending on whether you want the silver or the gold or whatever. Wearable sensors. Sensors in your dresses that you can wash repeatedly and wear them again and again. These will record your heart rate, your heart rhythm, your blood pressure, and again, you're remotely connected to your hospital where your cardiologist can sense something wrong with your heart rate or rhythm. He can call you over to the hospital and you can go there and get treated. Once you have that, oh, the pilot, Waverly Labs, you wear it like, uh, like a hearing aid. And if you wear one and the other person wears one, let's say you go to Japan, you don't know Japanese. When you talk, it translates your English in the other person's ear into Japanese. You keep moving around and picking up dropping, picking up there, dropping somewhere else. They keep driving all the time. There's no need to park them. If they are parked, the company loses money. These are smart cars again. So they can pick you up from your house. Last mile connectivity is already solved. It will spell the end of the car industry, spell the end of the oil industry, it will spell the end of the car insurance industry. Gone. These companies will be gone in the next 
10 to 12 years in, in our own lifespan. Even though I'm 66, I'm hopeful that it's going to happen in my own life, uh, lifespan. So 80% of parking space you can reclaim. All these huge parking spaces where you have scooters and bikes and you know, cars all parked can be reclaimed. Parks will come back into your cities again. Birds will come back into your cities again. There will be no honking. No need to honk. There's no steering wheel. There's no horn. There's no need to honk. No vehicle will bang into another vehicle. No need for all your traffic lights. No need for 80% of your highways. All these multi-billion dollar highways that we are building all over India now will not be required. You can reclaim all that. Just imagine what the world is going to be like with all this. The last part, we have five minutes? Or can I stop? Okay. Energy sector, is that going to be disruptive? Sadly, this is the way we produce most of our electricity. Spewing smoke everywhere, destroying the atmosphere, causing global warming, carbon dioxide levels which were almost stagnant for about 10,000 years, suddenly shot up, going through the roof. That's, that's the way we are, we are now. And unless we repent, if we repent now, by 20, 2100, 2100, we can reduce the carbon dioxide levels to lower than what it was in 1950. And the later we repent, the more time it's going to take and we will not be able to reach these levels for a very, very long time to come. And typically all countries, I'm just taking the example of US here, but all, including India, we produce electricity with coal, gas, oil, nuclear energy, hydroelectric and so on, where we're again wasting a lot of our resources and very little by solar. Same thing here. Solution is we need a nuclear fusion sort of a thing, you know? Something where uh, we have to rely on Einstein's formula where the, the, the resultant mass is much less than all the combined atoms and therefore that energy is released. It's, it's a huge amount of energy. But we already have one. We have one for billions of years you had. The sun comes up every day, goes on at night, the main thing that's preventing you from capturing the sunlight and then converting that into usable energy is the cost of the photovoltaic cell. That cost was $100 per watt in 1970. $100. It's come down to 12 cents. This is an oldest thing. 12 cents per watt now. $100 to 12 cents. Cost has come down tremendously. Going down by 22% year on year. Going down. That is one of the costs. In, in the US, Number of houses and, and institutions utilizing solar energy and putting up solar panels on their roofs is going up by 43% compounded annual growth rate. If it continues to rise at that level, by 2030 the entire world's energy needs will be met by solar energy alone. Some scientists believe, well, it's not just solar, but a combination of solar and wind energy and 100% of energy could be renewable by 2030. So it is possible within, like I said, within our own lifespans, our lifetimes. Even smaller countries, even Sri Lanka is targeting, at least they're thinking about it. They want entire 100% renewable energy by, by 2030. US, little more pessimistic, by 2050, they believe that it is possible to have 100% clean energy. They're already on their way, they're, they're breaking down dams. You may have read about that. The hydroelectric dams no longer required. These companies are sinking. They've broken down dams, the old rivers have started flowing again, the salmon, the, the fish that used to spawn up in the upper reaches of the river, they're able to now swim back up the river again, which is prevented by the dams. So nature is going to come back again, hopefully, in the next few years. But can solar continue to grow at this rate? It can because of several reasons. There are companies coming in saying, we will put up the solar panels on your house, free. Free, absolutely free. And only thing is, you, we will charge you only so much for the electricity, which is about one-fourth what you are at present spending. By 2020, three years from now, California, all new homes will have to have net zero energy. That means they have to generate all the energy that they are going to use. It's a federal law. They will have to abide by, by 2020. So costs are coming down. Costs will come down even further. All these other costs are going up, oil and natural gas and nuclear and all these things are going up. So as those costs, even though the petrol costs have come down, it's so you're not never going to go back to 3 rupees 60 paise for 5 liters of petrol. That's not going to happen. So the costs are going up, the solar energy costs are coming down, and once that happens where it meets around 
there's going to be disruption. So beyond this, it will be cheaper to put up solar panels on your house and generate your own electricity and sell it to the grid. All that is required is a small area to power the entire country. You don't need to set aside that space. You don't need to set aside 100,000 acres. France already is laying down a road, 1,000 kilometer road, photovoltaic cells. You can drive a truck on it, nothing is going to happen. It will generate electricity. Gujarat, home. Building these on top of canals. Gujarat apparently has about 70,000 kilometers of rivers and canals within that one state. So if they cover that with solar panels, they also prevent evaporation of water. So water is saved, electricity is generated. They built a large one, 10 megawatt thing over a canal. Ban Ki Moon, UK uh, chief came here. He saw that and he said it's an inspiration to the world. But sun shines only the, during the daytime, so you need storage solutions. And storage solutions are not these kind of batteries which are terrible. But again, lithium ion or molten salt energy, which is in outside Las Vegas, 50%, more than 50% of Las Vegas lights up at night due to stored energy. And these are the kind of uh, panels that you can uh, put up outside your house or even inside the 9.6 kilowatt hours of stored energy. All in this very, very sleek looking thing. And that will generate electricity during the night, power your house, you can sell that. And once cost of lithium ion batteries comes down, cost of photovoltaic cells uh, thing, uh, cost comes down. It's a matter of time before we have we've now decided that we're going to uh, install these uh, solar panels. The largest one is now in Karnataka. The world's biggest solar park is coming up in Karnataka. And uh, once this happens, there's going to be permanent disruption because of all these technologies. And that's going to happen, like I said, in, in every sector. Energy, manufacturing, construction, finance, healthcare sector, automotive sector, everything is going to be disrupted in the next five to 10 years. And as Gandhiji said, the ambition of the greatest men uh, of our generation has been to wipe every tear from every eye. That may be beyond us, but as long as there are tears and suffering, so long our work will not be over. So hopefully, it's going to be a very, very bright future for, for our, the next generation and there's no need to despair. Thank you very much.